Um, hi, I'm Leonard Petterling. I work on Systemd. Um, I'm going to talk about portable services are ready to use. Um, portable services is a new concept in Systemd. Um, and yeah, I'd like to introduce you to this. I did this talk before, by the way. Um, you might have seen it uh, if you attended DEF CONF or if you said have seen it at All Systems Go. Um, there's not, not going to be much new in that if you saw it there. Um, it probably would be cool if you would, if there are still people outside. Are there? Yeah, there are yeah. still people outside. So if you have seen it, um, yeah, you wouldn't miss anything. But apparently, nobody has seen it yet. Um, if you have any questions, completely, totally interrupt me right away. I much prefer my talks to be like conversations and uh, instead of just a, um, a Q and A at the end. So uh, do not um, hesitate, interrupt me. I love that. Um, yeah, let's jump right in. Portable services. What are portable services? Um, portable services. Um, you can see two ways. Like one way to see it is they're system services with some container features. But you can also see it the other way around. They're kind of like containers, but uh, with some uh, system service features, right? What does that mean? Um, like, first of all, we have to understand what containers are. I don't really know what containers are. Different people have different ideas about containers, uh, what they precisely consist of. Um, I think the definition that I tend to agree on is that they combine two, uh, like three concepts. One is resource bundles, right? That's what you do with containers. You pack them all up in a couple of tables. Um, like shared libraries and all the dependencies. <laughs> There's isolation, meaning that uh, they generally run in some form of sandbox. Like, might be a better one, might be a worse one, but there's at least some form of isolation generally. Um, and the delivery, right? Like, you, you deliver them on the, on the um, server you want to deploy the mouse on, and then you can run them there. So these three concepts is what at least I find most interesting about containers. I'm pretty sure that other people who care about containers probably would list more of that. Um, Portable services try to take some of these features and add them to classic um, uh, service management. Specifically, um, portable services are about making resource bundles available for regular system services. They are about integration, right? Like if you look at the previous slide, I had isolation there. I put integration here, right? Like because that's what system services are really in comparison to, to uh, containers. They're generally much more tightly integrated to the host system. Um, and sandboxing, right? Um, I do not put uh, delivery on this slide because I don't really care about delivery. But yeah, um, so uh, the difference really here is I don't care about delivery. And instead of isolation, I put integration and sandboxing here. Sandboxing for me is slightly different from isolation because like the way I see isolation, it's really about uh, creating a new world that is separate from the host you live in. While sandboxing, I kind of more see is like you're living still in the same world, but um, you can't do everything you want to do. Um, another key aspect of uh, portable services is that it's supposed to be highly modular, um, which, like, to show the opposition um, to classic container management is that, like, in container management, you generally tend to have to buy into the whole idea, right? And then some people don't do that and, for example, uh, end up with containers which they introduce the concept of super privileged containers, which are basically containers where you didn't uh, throw one uh, half of the con uh, concept away by turning off all the, the um, isolation features. But uh, yeah, portable servers are not supposed to be like that. Portable servers are supposed to be modular. You pick exactly what you want. Do you want the so resource bundling? And if you want, a uh, want to have sandboxing, you pick exactly how much um, uh, isolation or integration you want. Um, so it's really supposed to be modular and very, very fine-grained and doesn't require you to buy into the whole idea, but into parts um, um, only. Um, another way to look at it, consider range from integrated to isolated. If I was a good graphics artist, I would actually have drawn a graph here, but I'm lazy, very lazy. So I just uh, put a couple of words here with an arrow in the middle. Um, think about um, a range from integrated to isolated. Related, right? On one side, you have the classic system, the, uh, system services, right? Like so these are system five services or system D uh, uh, services. They tend to be very well integrated into the host, right? They live in the same world. They see the same network interfaces, the name file systems. They can establish file systems, mount them, and do things like that. They see the same users. They see everything because they are part um, of the host and they have full integration. On the other extreme, um, there's uh, VMs a la KVM, right? They tend to live in their entirely own world, right? Like they could be living on a different host after all. Um, and the way how they communicate with the rest of the um, stuff that runs on the local system is actually across the network, right? Like so you get a maximum of isolation. Um, Docker style microservices are probably somewhere in the middle, right? They 
they, it's not entirely clear if they are more like system servers or more like VMs. Um, I put them on my little um, range here in the middle. Full OS con containers are Alexi generally try to be something very similar to KVM, right? Like they, they expose the system that runs an init system inside and that you can SSH into. Um, as it's aging into is probably something you wouldn't do into Docker containers. Yeah. And now the concept that I'm going to introduce is portable system services, which I put close to classic system services, but somewhere on the range that goes towards Docker, right? So just to position this on a, on a, on a one-dimensional axis of integration versus isolation. Um, yeah, think about what's actually shared and not shared um, with these forms of uh, virtualization. Right, like uh, classic system services obviously have shared networking, right? Like they don't configure that. Like if I install Engine X as a System 5 service or as a System U service on my system, you don't configure networking explicitly for it. You just use the host uh, networking. While on the other extreme, of course, it's 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 completely separate, right? Like they have to run their own network management <coughs> solution inside of the VM for things to work. Um, uh, if you go along the axis, of course, um, yeah, Docker-style microservices generally do not configure own the, uh, networking, but they also don't share it with the host, so you have a relatively, like, yeah, but it, it really depends on how you configure things. LXC generally also it's like a little bit vague, but yeah. Um, think about file systems. Generally, Docker-style microservices do not share the file system, right? They have a different route, right? Um, so uh, they are relatively separate in this regard. Um, yeah, classic system servers, of course, are fully integrated. They see the same files and directories as everybody else. Um, VMs live in a completely different world, right? Like they have their own block devices, even and mount these block devices and see something that the host cannot even see, right? Um, think about PID namespaces, right? PID1 um, in classic system services is the same as the host, right? Like because it doesn't live in a, in a new PID concept, right? Like in PID55 that the, that the classic system service sees is actually the same PID55 that, that's actually running on the host, right? Um, in Docker-style microservices and everything to the right, that's not the case, right? Like, they generally live in their own little world where they have PID namespaces. Um, and, yeah, PID1 inside of it or PID55 or 77 is going to be something very different from what the container sees and from the host, right? And then the EMS, of course, PIDs are separate too, right? So you see, yeah, the PID namespace where the boundaries is somewhere there. Um, the unit system, it's kind of similar, right? Like, where is the cut there? If you have classic system servers, they, of course, share the init system with the host. I mean, that's what started there. Um, if you do Docker-style microservices, they, they, it's kind of weird because they generally don't have an init system. Like, there's no init system visible from the containers, but they also don't have their own. If you do LXC, then yes, you have an init system inside of the container generally. Um, I mean, yeah, people can disagree with me on this that, yeah, you can configure it differently. But yeah, I'm trying to position this in the general case how people tend to actually use this, right? Device access is also, yeah, if you do classic system services, you generally have raw <laughs> device access, right? Like you can access the block devices like the, or the sound card or whatever physical devices your, your, your computer has directly because you're living on a system, right? This is very different, of course, than VMs. VMs are generally isolated completely. Yes, I know that you can do pass-through and things like that, but that's kind of, that's magic uh, manual working to make this happen. It's not how this works out of, out of the box, right? And logging, on the other hand, tends to be much more integrated. Like even Docker-style microservices tend to log um, uh, we like provide the logging and it's, it's not done by the payload itself. So, yeah. So, um, the point of this lower thing is that it's actually, even though the access suggests it's a, it's a linear axis of integration, it's actually more multidimensional, right? Like, um, depending on what you look at, um, the cut where you get the integration and the isolation is more to the left and more to the right. I hope this makes um, any sense so far. Um, okay. Then portable services, one of the goals with portable services we had is uh, leave no artifacts, right? Like in containers, it's kind of a given, but on system services, it's not, right? What do I mean by that, actually? Um, uh, if on a, on, a, on a Linux system you install Nginx or MySQL or whatever package you, you like on your server, right? Um, download the depths or RPMs, install them, um, and then remove them again, right? Um, this leaves artifacts around, major artifacts. For example, 
on Unix, um, users are generally, like, you cannot sensibly delete system users or any kind of users, actually, because uh, um, if the user is created in some directory, some file, and you remove the user, these files will still be owned by the user ID of that user. So the, the file ownership is sticky, and if the user doesn't exist anymore that, that um, the file ownership refers to, then you have a problem, and then if the UID gets recycled um, later on, you have a, a, a security issue, right? So uh, this is a problem, I think, with Unix since forever. Most distributions generally do never delete users, right? So that basically means you install Nginx once, you remove it again. Yeah, your UID um, is gone for good. Um, with uh, portable services, um, our attempt was to fix that problem um, and uh, provide a way how uh, user IDs can be used, but they also become inherently transient. We'll talk about that in more detail, detail later on. What this specifically means, but it, it's not just about uh, system users, actually. Um, there should be no artifacts left around. Like, if you ran a service and you remove it again, like, for example, temporary files should be gone as well, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's about binding life cycles. Like when a, service, um, a system service starts up, it can allocate a couple of resources. When it shuts down, they are released. And unlike classic system services, we don't leave stuff around. Um, another goal of portable services is to have everything in one place. This is kind of the the uh, the uh, bundling thing, right? Like, yeah, it's 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 not a new concept, of course, because Cheroots existed in Unix since forever. In fact, the whole of portable services you can summarize as yeah, making Cheroots useful. Um, but uh, yeah, it's one of the key goals. Um, you know, I'm I'm a systems well, a service guy, of course, because yeah, I wrote most of systemd. Um, so for me, yeah, doing Cheroots is awesome, but I want to make them available um, to uh, service managers in a very, like, to, to regular system service in a very powerful way, and that's what uh, portable services are. Uh, another goal is I want this new concept that adds these couple of portable, uh, of, of container features to service management a lot like a native service, right? Because I want it to actually be a native service. Native by this, I mean um, like a regular systemd service like ha that has a dot .service file or so on. So the ultimate goal um, after this is that if the portable services are used, then you end up uh, having an init system that supports three formats for services. The native ones, classic ones, systemd service uh, files. The old system5 init scripts, right? And these new portable services. And um, as you, like, if you're using systemd, you already notice that the behavior of system5 init scripts and regular um, uh, systemd services, the behavior, like, do you, you do system control start and stop on them and can reset resources and see the logs of them, it doesn't really matter. Like, this distinction is, is, is removed. Um, the key with the portable service concept is to do the same here, too. Um, okay, so, the, so much about the goal, so much about the positioning of this new concept of portable services. Let's talk about the why, right? Like, this is a question we always have to ask. Yeah, I already mentioned that I'm a service management guy, so um, I, we don't live in a, in a vacuum, right? Like, uh, things happen around us, containers happen, of course, right? They have a, a lot of mind share, and they are in a form of form, uh, in a way, a form of uh, service management, um, but a lot removed from the, from the core system. But there are definitely a couple of good ideas that I think make a ton of sense to take and apply to system service management as well, right? It's, about, it's not about coming up with anything new. It's just about looking what, what's good, what's out there, and then figuring out, is this something that we want for service management, like for regular service management as well? And I think this, yeah, the bundling and the sandboxing is. So let's uh, apply it there as well. Um, also, what's uh, really interesting to notice is um, uh, at this point in time, pretty much all packages uh, of, of, of services that are viable tend to have native systemd service files. Right, so in a way, most of the stuff that already exists on the internet tends to have these service files, and that's actually kind of cool because it allows us to, to if we add a little bit of on top, we can do something that goes in the in the direction of containers without actually defining any new new kind of metadata, um, because we already have the service uh, files, and pretty much everything has these service files at this point already. Um, yeah, another concept is like. Uh, you know, containers is a separate world um, uh, where you use different tools. Um, admins generally are used to system service already. Um, so maybe we can just make them more powerful in some regards because, yeah, some of the features that you want to have in containers, you can just make a, a viable for regular system services as well. One primary use case um, for uh, portable services, I mean, just to make this clear, this is not an attempt to, to reinvent containers or something like this. I 
explicitly want to position it as something that is more low level than this. Um, and I explicitly want to uh, uh, position it for use cases where containers might not be the most appropriate way to do things. Like if you want to use containers for something and containers are the right choice for you, what you do, continue doing this. This is supposed to be a little bit more low level. Um, so one primary use case is uh, what uh, people have dubbed super privileged containers so far. It's, um, uh, for example, storage people like to do this, right? Like um, they, uh, they, uh, um, they want to ship a lot of complex stack in one image onto your server machine, right? Um, that's why they want to use containers. But on the other hand, they need a really strong um, integration into the whole system because they need to do device management, like block device management. They need to, to figure out what's, what's being plugged in, what iSCSI does, and whatever else, right? So they, they are in this weird position that they, they would like to ship a lot of complex stack software with its own dependencies because it's all far from trivial onto existing machines, but they also want the full um, uh, integration into the host because they do device management, and if you do device management, that's where you really, really need it. So uh, yeah, inside of Red Hat, there was these people working on super privileged containers. Um, when I saw that, I said, "This is horrible!" Like because they they ended up using Docker initially, and then they turned off all the sandboxing features and created all these bridges that inside of uh, that you could escape from inside of the Docker to the host, so that they can could do the manipulations of the device that and everything is like. <laughs> but yeah, portable servers are supposed to cover that use case um, uh, uh, perfectly, right? Like so that you can have. Um, your, uh, your bundling and all these kind of things, but you can pick exactly how much you want to see from the system or um, how much you want to be isolated from the system uh, without being completely and terribly ugly. Yeah, um, also one of the key ideas is um, integration is, is, is a good thing often, not the bad thing, right? Like with containers and, and all these things, they, they, they're very strong about isolation. I think in many use cases, um, uh, you want the integration. Not in all, but in many you do, right? So uh, um, yeah. It really depends on your use case, um, integration, and the ability that you can introspect the rest of the system, um, and, and particularly for tracing <laughs> tools and, and debugging functionality and metrics and these kind of things. It's a really, really good thing um, if you do not have to first um, play games with the sandboxing to escape it. OK, I kind of mentioned this already. Uh, one of the goals uh, is that, yeah, the System 5 uh, services, the native service and the portable service are supposed to be next to each other and equally well supported with the same interfaces and same behavior, same resource management, same everything. Um, the building blocks this all is built off are actually permit more, right? Like uh, uh, the portable services uh, uh, code base is actually relatively separate. Uh, it, it, like when we added that to SystemD, um, like the portable control command that, that makes all of this available. Um, it didn't actually require any changes on the um, system decor itself. It just added a new utility um, that allows you to interface with the existing um, uh, sandboxing options and bundling options in a nicer, uh, more integrated way, right? So uh, this is kind of, because it is implemented that way, it basically even would allow you to come up with your completely own service delivery framework, use all these basic um, uh, uh, concepts and build something completely different, right? Like, for example, people have been working on making OCI stuff uh, work um, and translate them dynamically into native system service and things like that. Um, yeah. One key idea about... Um, uh, any questions so far, by the way? N nobody has interrupted me yet about all the stuff that... Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about disk images, right? Like, when we think resource bundling, we have to think about disk images in some form. Docker, uh, as you know, uses tarballs and then weird layers and AUFS and these kind of things. Um, in, uh, yeah, one of the goals with portable services was no new metadata, right? Like, I didn't want to sit down and come up with a new OCI spec. I have no interest in whatsoever in that. I didn't want to uh, define a new image format or anything. I have no interest whatsoever in that, and it's like a it political uh, uh, massive job. So, um, with system portable services, the key really is we use the metadata we already have. Specifically in disk images, this means um, we don't care what, 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 how the bundled uh, images come onto the system as long as um, the moment you actually want to start them, they are accessible as a Linux uh, uh, accessible file system in some way. Um, we're happy. What does that mean? You can ship things as tarball if you like and unpack them, and then uh, systemd can uh, use it as a portable services. But you don't have to. You can also use it as a disk image, right? Like a UFI block device image that you can mount. Um, in uh, systemd, um, with the portable services concept, we support both equally, right? The key, what we 
just require from people is that they use a user, uh, uh, pr provide images on the block layer or on the file system unpacked layer. But in both cases, it needs to be something that the Linux kernel natively supports. Is the support, support naked file system images like Scorpio Yes, that's kind of what I'm, the point that I was making, right? It's like, uh, I don't really care uh, what you use. And we explicitly support both block device level stuff and unpacked uh, uh, tarball kind of stuff, right? So, but not just a file system. You need a block device with partition tables in. Um, so the question, I was supposed to repeat the question, right? Uh, not just, uh, so the question was re re regarding whether um, whatever is mounted as a disk image has to be a proper uh, a block device or if it has, uh, it can be just a regular file. The idea is it's just a regular file, right? It can be a block device, but the idea is it's normally it's a regular, fi regular file. And systemd will internally do the, the uh, loopback mounting and stuff like that. So you will never actually see that there are loopback devices and block devices uh, involved in the end. But the idea is generally, um, yeah, either take a table and compress it and you operate on the file system le level or um, provide us with maybe a SquashFS uh, uh, file um, and uh, systemd will uh, set it up as a loopback and mount it. And then it's kind of the same thing at, from that point on. Yep. So the question was regarding, uh, yeah, if we can point it to a folder, yeah, that's the tarball option, right? Like that I mentioned, right? Like the fact that tarball is used, I don't give a damn about that, right? Like I, as long as it's there in a format that the Linux kernel natively supports, which could be a directory or could be a uh, something that I can mount, I'm happy. Um, Are you aware of anybody? I guess maybe at Red Hat using OS3 with this. Uh, so the question was regarding whether uh, I know of anybody using OS3 with this. Uh, I heard of people who were interested in this, but I didn't follow up um, uh, uh, in details. But of course, you can totally use OS tree, like because as mentioned, if it's a directory, it's good enough for us. And OS tree stuff, after you checked it out, is just a directory, so all is good. So. Let me move on from that. Because um, you just that, I was going to ask it later, but I'll ask it now. Um, I was thinking about how this relates to the stuff that I was doing about like, the stuff in OMP things. And then I was wondering, is this partially you trying to park? So yeah, the question was uh, probably uh, let's. I guess I can summarize it, uh, the relationship to to uh, OS3 and, and and snaps, right? Yeah, to flat packs and snap. So I mean, the the key really here is this stuff is system level stuff, right? So uh, flat packs not system level stuff. Snap is though, right? This is actually in the design very close to to snap what it does, but I mean. I don't really care about the disk images as mentioned, right? You, you can actually uh, use even a snap disk image if you want. The, the focus that I have really is, is after it's there, um, uh, how to make the stuff that's in that image available as a regular system service, right? And this is what they generally don't care about or, or, or want to provide. So uh, yeah, um, flat packs, different story, desktop stuff. Um, this stuff requires privileges. People have asked about making this available unprivileged, but it's kind of difficult because uh, at least if you do disk images, uh, it's all about um, mounting and loopback devices, and none of that is available pr uh, unprivileged. <laughs> I hope that answered the question a little bit. Um, yeah, key here really is let's avoid not something new. Right? I don't want to be in the business of defining image file formats. So yeah, let's just take simple directory trees or better subvolume, or maybe a GPT containing SquashFS, but actually we don't really care if it's SquashFS, and we don't really care about if it's GPT either. I just think it's a nice thing to do. Um, the services run directly from these images, right? Um, there has been this root image and root directory service um, setting since ages in systemd. Um, we just make use of this here to say, yeah, now I run the service from this image, and then the moment the service starts, this image is mounted, if it's not mounted yet, or bind mounted, and uh, yeah, this is the moment the service um, shuts down, that, yeah, the image is not used anymore. Um, in a way, this is about like, uh, like fixing Chiroot. I mean, Chiroot has been around since ages, and some people deploy, have deployed things like that in the, since the 90s. But uh, Chiroot has a couple of uh, serious problems. Like, for example, uh, uh, one of the bigger ones we'll talk about later on is about um, like SC pass WD, because you kind of have to synchronize the SC pass WD on the host with the container. Uh, we'll talk about that, what we're doing in this um, uh, area. What's, uh, by the way, interesting, because we actually do, so like root image, this stands as basically where you specify a, a, a squash file system, like any kind of file system that the kernel mounts. Root directory is where you specify a directory. 
Um, but uh, be the root image thing is actually kind of nice because um, when we mount the stuff, we can actually uh, take benefit of all the weird um, uh, storage stuff that the Linux kernel has. Um, two things are particularly interesting, I think, like uh, one is uh, you can lux encrypt, for example, an image, and then just make system the um, uh, start the service from it, um, so you can have a model of, of, of basically encrypted services. And Verity, I find even more interesting. Verity, for those who don't know, is a, is a kernel a concept about uh, um, that every access um, uh, to the disk, or in this case to the image, is verified as the access happens cryptographically against a, uh, some uh, predefined hash value that can be signed. So uh, with that, you can actually make uh, trusted um, services in a way where you basically say, yeah, I have this computer here, and it will only run software that is signed by me. And then you um, deploy an image on it. And then system will start it, but system will only start it if the um, top level hash of that image is uh, uh, matches against some signature stacking, uh, checking stuff that makes sure that it's only my stuff that runs. Um, don't want to talk too much about that because it's probably a talk of its own. Just wanted to mention is simply by the fact that we rely on whatever the Linux kernel provides us with, we can make these things happen. And we did make this happen. It was all hooked up. So yeah. Um, so the question was um, if this means that we can use another distribution to start services uh, on, 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 on some host system. And yes, it's ma this is what it means, right? Like the idea is um, that much like for containers, the distribution that is used inside of, the, of this image doesn't have to match what's on the host. Um, and uh, things should still work just fine because the Linux kernel people might not be perfect in uh, maintaining compatibility, uh, like compatibility with everything, but they're pretty good, right? Um, Okay, yeah. Um, the only thing that an image uh, needs to uh, have to qualify as a portable service is, is that it has to carry system to unit files, that it has to carry a file user lib OS release, and that's it. Um, it has to carry system to unit files because we need to know what to actually start in it, right? Like, so it um, has to have that. As mentioned, it's kind of cool that all uh, uh, software that uh, uh, currently exists generally has these already. Um, and the user libOS release file is something that has been existing since uh, five years already. We came up with this originally in the systemd context, but it's actually uh, adopted um, uh, universally even beyond, uh, like even the systemd haters now uh, ship this file. It's a, it's a very simple file that um, is supposed to describe the distribution you use, but it's actually extensible. So our idea was, yeah, we use that as a metadata information that if you want to declare um, what the image uh, that you have there is about, you just add a field there. And, yeah, so. Again, the key here is no new metadata, um, no new formats. We use Linux file systems. We use system unit files. We use the OS release file. Nothing of that is new. All of this exists at, for at least five years, and in many cases, for 10, 20 years. Um, any questions about this so far? So in this case, if you don't want to use portable control to start the service, the portable service, you have to declare like a host system service file to load the portable service which then in turn carries the system service file? Uh, so that was a very complicated question, and I would like to delay that to the end. Um, if I hope we have enough time, well, uh, kind of introduce a little bit to the command line, um, if we have enough time to, because that will, I think, explain your uh, question. Somebody else had a question? Okay. okay, then let's talk about that a little bit later. Um, one quick slide. I mean, there's lots of stuff on this, but I don't want to go too much into detail. The point I want to make here is like systemd for a longer time had all these sandboxing options for system services, right? This is independent, like as everything else that I said, from the actual portable service con uh, concept. These things existed since uh, some longer, some shorter, but they are generally options how you can lock down your system services. Just as an example, private devices, for example, is a Boolean that you can set on a system service. If you turn it on, it basically means that the service gets its own instance of slash dev that doesn't contain any real uh, devices, but dev u ren and dev uh, uh, null, dev zero, and these kind of pseudo devices that are uh, Unix API or Linux API, but don't actually reflect to real physical devices you could touch. Um, and there are a couple of other options of this where, where they are generally designed to be super easy, like Booleans or something very close to being uh, just a Boolean, how you can lock down your services. Um, in the portable services concept, we just make use of the fact that this already exists. There's one major difference, though. Um, you can turn these on on your uh, uh, classic system service already, um, but they generally are opt-in so far, right? Which is something 
I mean, we would like to turn that around, of course, but at this point we can't really for compatibility reasons, like because system services have been around. Like, I mean, they inherit everything from System 5 even. And since System 5 and in the beginning System services did not have sandboxing, if we would turn that on by default, now we would break everything. Right? So for the classic stuff, it's opt-in. For the portable services, we have the luxury, though, because it's a new concept we just introduced, uh, it's the reverse. It's opt out, right? Like so, by default, you get a policy, but you can actually opt out from everything. And if you do, then you get the full integration to the host system. Can do whatever you want. Um, yeah, these are a couple of that we already have. Um, uh, I did talks in the past talking about all of them in detail because they actually do fill like a talk of their own. Um, they're gonna be more. Uh, there's also nowadays, which is really interesting to know, is like the per service firewalling these days, where you can set inside of the unit file, you can do access control. Um, on IP level and things like that. This is and, and IP accounting actually this is so awesome. But um, yeah, it kind of fits into this whole sandboxing concept. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this. Sandboxing is opt out for portable services rather than opt in. Um, how much time do I have? This is twenty minutes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about these hard problems. Um, this is I kind of already mentioned this. Um, uh, if you do Cheroot's classic on Unix, you have this problem that, uh, yeah, because the Cheroot environment generally doesn't see the user database of the host, um, both uh, like the host and the, and the Cheroot environment might have a different idea what uh, UID 500 means, right, or UID 1000 means. So uh, most of the how-tos that you find on the internet that tell you how to manually set up a Cheroot um, are by, yeah, copy over Etsy past WD. Um, yeah. Uh, because portable servers are ultimately just a way to make um, uh, Cheroots more useful to work. Uh, we try to figure out what we can do in this area. For this, we con added a concept called dynamic users. Dynamic users is something that is particularly useful in, in the context of portable services, but you can use it already on your system independently of it. And uh, yeah, it's the one building block, but the building block can be used in any context you like. It just happens to be one of the building blocks portable services are built on. What are dynamic users? Dynamic users is a concept where you basically can say for a service that when the service starts, a system um, user is registered, and when the service shuts down, it's released again. Right? I've already mentioned this problem. Now you have this problem with the with the file stickiness, right? So that uh, yeah, when the service then goes down and the, the service uh, the the user ID is released, what happens to the files that the uh, uh, service created while it was running? Our solution to this is a couple of things. First of all. Um, when the service writes something to slash temp or slash var temp, uh, yeah, we it will not be able to do this. What it instead uh, will do, it will get its own fake little slash temp and fake little var temp that actually is backed by the real one. But whatever the service writes into that is um, automatically free, uh, removed when the when the service shuts down. Right? This is what I call lifecycle binding. Right? Like the the lifecycle of the of the system is bound to the life cycle of the temporary files. So when the service goes down, the temporary files go with it. Right? So that's one facet of it. But it's not particularly useful yet. Um, so the other thing is, uh, yeah, to deal with the sticky uh, file ownership problem, our solution is we simply disallow the service to write anywhere. Right? So uh, uh, it's, it's a nice way to avoid the problem with sticky files by simply prohibiting uh, files altogether. Right? So uh, this, of course, limits the usefulness, because you then have a service that can write stuff to temp and var temp, but can't do anything else. I mean, it's good enough for probably some use cases, but probably uh, uh, most use cases want to have be able to actually write stuff to disk and like whatever they generate. So our way out of this is, uh, is uh, in, uh, in systemd, that's actually all also independently useful um, of dynamic users and independent of portable services. There's a concept where you can specify a state directory um, inside of the service file. If you do that, that basically means that if a directory in var lib um, gets uh, uh, churned, um, like the ownership gets uh, changed to the services system user the instant uh, the service is started, right? Um, so uh, the, basically, the idea here, hence, is that systemd manages for you of specific directories the ownership. And these, um, the service then gets access to for writing. Right? This is a little, a little bit ugly, right? Like, because it basically means that you start up your service for the first time. Systemd creates a new directory in Valib for that specific service, changes the ownership um, uh, of that directory to the system user. It also located for you. Then you run, you write some stuff to it, you shut down again. Now the user gets released. 
the, the data shall stick, stick around, and it does, and then you start again. But now you might have gotten a different user ID. So what system has to do, it has to recursively churn everything. That is horrible, um, but it's actually not as bad as it sounds because Linux is very much optimized on that. And uh, even if you have a directory tree that's a couple of gigabytes, at least on my machines, it never took more than a couple of seconds to churn recursively through it. Um, if it's something uh, smaller than a couple of gigabytes, uh, it's practically not no noticeable. Also, the system tries really, really hard to assign the same services, the same um, dynamic user IDs as it can by hashing them out the, of the name of the service and things like that. However, given that the name, like the UAD space is a little bit too short, um, collisions will happen. In that case, it has to churn. So in the meantime, the system stopped after it's running from the first time. You, do you change it to root only? Or? That's a very good question. Um, so the problem is, of course, um, if uh, the service started up, has its own directory, then our service goes down. Now these files are there, still owned by uh, this user ID that now ceased to exist, right? This is, of course, the problem we always wanted to avoid. So what do we do? We take a, a lesson out of how containers are managed, because in containers, they generally say stored somewhere in valid containers or valid Docker or something like that. And the way, because they have the very same problem, they, they also have a completely, like they have a concept of users that only exist while the container is running. The way they avoid it is they have a top-level directory uh, where all the containers are stored, and this top-level directory is not uh, uh, readable by anybody but root, basically, right? So they avoid this by adding a barrier in the middle so that it doesn't matter if the files that are uh, stored below um, are owned by the by a user ID that is otherwise recycled, uh, potentially now, simply by just cutting it off in the middle and saying, yeah, that uh, entire subtree is not available to you. And that's exactly what we do here. Now, um, this is actually harder than it sounds because we want to make available var lib foo for a service foo so what do we do? Do we change the ownership of our lib to 7.0.0? We can't really do that, right? Um, so uh, this is actually tricky in the background. Um, what actually happens there, um, there's a directory varlib private. And varlib private, that thing is actually 7.0.0. I hope you guys still follow this. This sounds like without slides. <laughs> Really nasty to follow. Um, so that one is actually 0700, and then there's a symbol automatically created from varlib um, uh, uh, foo into varlib private foo um, to make it invisible to the outside. And from the inside, right, like because the inside shall have access to this directory even though it's unprivileged, through bind mounts we make the varlib private hidden and instead mount it to the top. And I hope you kind of followed at all what I was babbling here. It took us a while to figure out that this is actually workable and is nice. and I really like to get rid of much of this code and uh, maybe one day we can if we have shift fs in the kernel like the, like the file system where you can actually uh, change the user ids so far we can't um i don't know I, I i try to come up with anything better and talk to a lot of people we couldn't the general runtime behavior of this even though we do the recursive churning is kind of nice right it's it's not as like it's not a costly operation because inode updates like because we never actually write through files we just change the the inode ownership are surprisingly fast on Linux and on the file system these days. There was someone who had a. What if you do send to That's a very good question. Um, the, uh, so the question was, what happens if you have two services that want access to the same directory? Um, the thing is, like, if they have two dynamic users attached to it, that's not going to work, right? Like, Unix doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. It would allow that if we have shift of S, which we don't. Right? I hope that we eventually can fix it and make this happen. As long as that um, uh, uh, is not available, though, what you can do is you can, uh, like, systemd actually, when it creates these dynamic users, honors the username you specify inside of the unit file. Now, if you have two unit files, both of them have dynamic user uh, turned on, and both of them specify the same username, systemd will actually create one of the same user for this. Right? And if, it hap if you do this, then you can actually share this directory. Right? But it's really on you. Systemd won't help you right now with this, because I kind of still hope that shiftfs is a real thing eventually. Like I actually, whether the, uh, the uh, container mini conf just before here, where uh, one of the guys actually talked about this, and then he said that's going to happen. But yeah, we'll see when that's uh, going to happen. But yeah, you can do it, but you have to be careful to use the same usernames for the services that want to access. Sorry? So the question is about uh, what about couldn't you use something with groups instead? But I mean, the general problem is that the that the user IDs. Yeah, well, I mean, the problem is that that it's up to the programs then to to make this happen because they can't, for example, create files that have non-writable things like that. 
right? So I, in my assumption, like I, we thought about this, but using SELs in particular to make something like this happen. But the the, the problem I always uh, saw with that is like it, these solutions tend to end up being something that applications need to explicitly support because many applications manage the access control uh, manually. While with this solution we went for, it's transparent to the applications. They don't know that there is like, well, I mean, if they look from the outside, they will see the weird thin link. But from the inside, there's no difference um, from a from regular, like, uh, yeah. So. So the, um, just a thought, so where about does that map, where does that look like in, in the bind name space inside the portal? So the question was, how does the file system look like inside of the uh, uh, services uh, uh, namespace, basically? <laughs> it, like, if you provide a image, right, like, for example, a squash of this image or mm, directory, um, and then you uh, uh, have a unit file inside of it, and then you told portable control with the command that I'm going to show you later to attach this thing to the host, which basically means copy the unit file out of it, put it on the host, and uh, update it slightly so that there's a root directory or root image setting that points it back to the image file. If you then start the stuff, what it sees from the inside is exactly what is uh, inside of that image, except for the stuff where you um, uh, punch the holes into. And the holes that you punch are generally something like a state directory, the thing that I was already mentioned. If you specify state directory in the <coughs> unit file, it basically means that directory that you picked there in var lib is shared between a host um, and the user. And if dynamic user is turned on, which is an optional feature, then it does the magic um, EID stuff. And then there are a couple of other settings like this. There is, uh, uh, besides state directory, there is cache directory, which does the same in var cache. There is uh, config configuration directory, which you might guess does the same thing in Etsy. Uh, there's runtime directory, which does the same thing in you might guess slash run. Uh, there's one or more. Um, uh, logs directory, true. So where you get the same thing in var log. Um, so, but the model really is towards pushing people to do be more to declarative in the in the services um, by denoting exactly which which of the directories are actually relevant to the service, and then this actually uh, doubles as the way how you can punch holes into this sandbox in a safe way because we do the dynamic user rechoning if necessary. Uh, the question is if we support arbitrary bind mounts from the host, we do. But if you do that then of course you can't use the dynamic user ID thing so easily because we would have to chone magic, but uh, if it's arbitrary stuff, we can't insert the valid private thing in, in between so everything explodes. But by all means, go and do that. Like for example, the storage people, um, they, they would run their stuff as root anyway, not as a dynamic user, right? And for them, yes, use as many explicit bind bounds as you want um, and the, make a viable whatever uh, you want to have a viable. But I mean, yeah, so the question is regarding if uh, distributions uh, could like uh, ship tiny portable images and use stuff from the host. Yes, they can, right? It's, I'm, I'm not going to prohibit that from you. This is a completely generic tool. You can misuse it anyway, like. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not going to rule into that. Would I do that, right? I'm not sure. Like, I mean, part of the idea about portable servers, of course, is that you, um, much like for containers, that you distance yourself from the ABI of the of the host, right? So to make the stuff more portable. Just use the existing sandboxing stuff. Sorry. You probably just use the existing sandboxing stuff directly, and not the portable. Yeah. Um, so ten minutes. Okay, uh, well, I got a couple of more slides. It's completely fine that I didn't cover this um, because I got so many good questions and even more here. That's um, is it possible to start multiple instances of a service of portable stuff like this in the small system service? So the question was regarding whether it's possible to start multiple instances of a portable service like it is possible with regular services. The answer to that is a clear and resounding yes because these things aren't native services, right? So if you put a template file, um, like a template unit uh, inside of a portable services, then you can instantiate it as many times as you want, just like you could do it with a template unit that is installed on the host. Um, I want to, yeah, so let's. Uh, the question was regarding whether if you do the multiple instance stuff, uh, whether they can share the same user ID. 
Um, yes, absolutely, but they don't even have to be multiple instances of the same service in that case, right? As mentioned earlier, if you have two unrelated, uh, otherwise unrelated services that are not instances of the same one, you can do the same thing. What's key is that you turn on dynamic users in both cases and that you set user equals the same string, uh, which is the name. It's also possible, right? So to repeat the question, if you want to have different user IDs for every instance, instance, yes, you can do this too. Which is actually really, really awesome for the dynamic user stuff because you can actually implement v v trivially now a service that is socket activated, right? And for each incoming uh, connection, a new instance is created and each instance gets its own dynamic user that lives as long as this connection um, uh, exists and then goes away again. To me, this is actually like the, just this concept of making user ID something cheap that you can have and then you have, can return them and they don't become this extremely expensive thing that stick around forever and hence your package can only allocate like one or two or maybe three but never like 100 of these. Um, yeah, the, this is actually one of the, like I, I see it as a breathing new life into the a Unix concept of user IDs because uh, suddenly you can use them for much more than you traditionally could. And that is so awesome actually because user IDs are like the, the, the core security feature of Unix after all, right? Like all the other stuff that we have these days with as a Linux and, and UpArmor um, and, and whatever else is it with Secom came later and is specifically supported in only one concept. But the user IDs as a security concept have existed always and are built into every piece of our software after all. So adding the dynamic uh, system user concept to that is kind of like, yeah, it, it turns something really established into a much more powerful concept. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about this slide here as my last slide then, um, just to give you a little bit of feeling. I don't have demo because demos tend to go wrong, but I want to at least show you how the concept generally works. Uh, yeah, the m m command you, you use for interfacing with portable um, uh, service is called portable control. Um, it, uh, yeah, you invoke it portable control with uh, the verb attach, for example. Uh, foobar.raw in this case is a disk image, like could be, for example, a, a SquashFS image in there. When you do this, right, when you invoke this, then this portable service image is attached to the host. What does it mean? It means that, yeah, portable control will do a little bit of verification that it's the same image, and then it will just copy out a couple of unit files from this image. Which unit files will it copy? Actually, the ones that start with the same name as the, the image file itself. So if the image file is called foobar.raw, the unit files it copies out are foobar dash whatever you like, as well as foobar dot whatever you like. Uh, the unit files that are copied out don't have to be service unit files, by the way. They can be socket unit files as well. They can be target unit files. They can be whatever you else. Like, like, not all of them, not all eight of them uh, that we have in systemd, but uh, most of them. So you can, the, what this, this basically means is that you can uh, package a couple of uh, related units into one image, right? Um, you just have to follow a little naming regime that you always call them some prefix dash some suffix, and the prefix is always the same. Um, you can use socket activation, time activation, all of this at the same time, and just by part of a control attach, all of them become available in the, in the system. And from that point on, they are regular services. So you, at that point, you can do portable, uh, can, uh, system control start, system control stop, system control set property, system control uh, whatever else you kill, whatever. You can do journal control dash U with them because after they're copied out like that, um, they are regular system services. There's nothing distinguishing them anymore except for the fact, yeah, that they originally got copied out of some, some uh, image file. And then, of course, there's Yes, uh, portable control attach, if you call it like this, is actually across reboots. Um, so the files are copied out into Etsy. Um, uh, there's actually portable control attach dash dash runtime as well, and you might guess it copies them into slash run. So the attachment, um, the fact that the unit files exist on the host goes away when you reboot. Um, yeah, there's obviously the other verb that undoes all of this. It just removes the files where, that were copied out, and then at that point the servers are not available on the host, right? Um, key again is leave no traces. The idea really is that uh, besides logs, like because we never should delete logs, um, uh, 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 yeah, after you do, do the detach, nothing remains in the system. Can you uh, do you have templated uh, unit files as well? Can you use so the question is, yeah, it, whether, the, the, whether this, these can be template unit files? Yes, they can. Um, the files that are copied out um, just have to have foobar as a prefix followed by either a dot or a dash. 
Um, but what comes after that, it doesn't really matter. It can be a template. It can be an instance, even. Um, it's Um, and by the way, by default, um, uh, like the idea is that you enable them all uh, at the same time as attaching, but you don't have to. You can, you can attach them and then enable them, or you, you don't. It's completely up to you. Um, yeah. Last question. I've seen the, the drop, the drop and replacement working. Sorry. I've seen the, the drop and replacement work as well. Uh, oh, you mean drop-ins. Okay, the, the question was regarding uh, um, like the drop-in files we support for unit files so that you can extend them on the host. Yes, these because they after they're copied out, um, uh, they are regular unit files. You can also extend the contained unit files on the host by dropping stuff onto the host um, in Etsy and run like because they are native unit files at, at that point. They don't distinct, they're not distinct anymore. Um, you can do everything you can do. You can even do system control edit if you like, and then um, system control will drop in the uh, unit file for you. Um, if you do detach, however, these ones would not be removed, All right? Because yeah, I mean we could probably add that, but uh, it's probably yeah, it probably needs an extra switch because admins might be pissed if we remove the configurations they the changes made they have. This was my last question, so thank you very much, everybody. If you have further questions, I'm going to be outside. <laughs>